everyone, as has already been said, who suffers from Parkinson's exhibits slightly different symptoms, suggesting that there uh, are potentially more than one cure. On the other hand, if I understand it correctly, um, the root cause of the disease is um, degradation of the dopamine-producing cells in the SNPC. That suggests that dopamine replacement therapy ought to work for all. Um, there's a dichotomy. Can you expand on that a bit? You touched on it uh, well, previously. Well, and in fact, our research on transplants of Parkinson's began uh, 20 years ago here in Cambridge with the, answering the question of what's the difference between different types of people with Parkinson's. So we collected everyone with Parkinson's in the county of Cambridgeshire over a two-year period and followed them over time. And it was clear that over time, as you say, the biggest difference was that there were clearly a group of people who tended to be relatively younger, who progressed relatively slowly, whose main problem always seemed to be mainly motor. And there was clearly a second group of people who were older with disease onset, who seemed to progress more quickly into developing thinking problems, balance problems, and, and, and uh, problems with um, uh, you know, controlling blood pressure and balance and such like. So uh, one, of the, one of the questions we then asked, well, what's different between these two people? Well, clearly age is different, and what drives aging is a critical factor. But it's also clear that there are certain genetic variations which determine how people behave. So my interpretation on the heterogeneity of Parkinson's is that Parkinson's is fundamentally one disease process, but that actually what happens is people progress at different rates, and the reason they progress at different rates is that the pathway which is driving the problem with the protein which is associated with it, in some people there are many problems in that pathway, so the pathway soon gets overwhelmed and you end up with problems in lots of different sites, and in some people they can handle it much better, and so it tends to be more localised. So I think, from, our, from my point of view, one of the things we've been trying to develop is the idea that there is a, a form of Parkinson's which is more benign, if you like. It's more around dopamine, and that type of patient would do extremely well with these type of therapies we talked about today. There's a more, if you like, malignant form of the disease where it tends to progress more quickly, and that might be the very group who are best served by drugs which are designed to slow down the disease process as has been sort of championed, if you like, by the Cure Parkinson's Trust through their linked clinical trials. So I, I, I think, uh, and there are now several studies. There's a big study in the UK uh, run out of Oxford, uh, and there's a big study which is run throughout the whole UK called ProBand, where they're trying to segregate patients into different groups. And I think both of those groups have now said th that there are probably three or four types, but I would say these two main types clearly sort of frame the different types that are there. But Claire, I'm sure you have other views. Well, I was looking for a place to disagree with you, and I almost got you, but not quite. Um, <laughs> when you said Parkinson's is one, one process, right? I, I would say Parkinson's, it's, I'd like to see it as um, not one single disorder. I'd like to figure out a way that we can um, work on defining subtypes. Um, with a practical viewpoint, it's not just to break down um, for the intellectual uh, satisfaction of it. It's really to see if we could figure out subtypes of, uh, of Parkinson's where people in subtype A might do better with one particular therapy. Um, perhaps, you know, you could think about some people do great with levodopa and don't really have much of a problem in terms of developing dyskinesia. And yet I've seen other patients in my practice where I start them on a low dose, and within six months, they're already starting with head bobbing and a little bit of weaving. So I think Roger's right. I think it's actually going to turn out to have a genetic underpinning. And it's kind of, it's hard to get at that because Parkinson's is so complicated. And so what we try to do, um, Roger mentioned these uh, uh, kind of data databases where you accumulate data on a l an awful lot of people, hundreds of people. In the US, we uh, are very lucky to have a study running called PPMI, um, and it's run by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and they've been collecting very carefully systematic data on people from the time that they're diagnosed and they're not taking medicine, and then they just follow them over the years. And one of my colleagues, Fei Wang, does this um, approach called machine learning. It's like deep learning. Um, and it, he starts off uh, with, without any particular preconceptions of what subtypes of Parkinson's should be like. Um, and as he analyzed the data, 
I was actually struck by how similar his findings were to um, the people in the, the team in the UK. And he thought that he could see three different subtypes, um, meaning that you might be able to take some of that data right up front, you know, and predict. And for me as a clinician, I could say, well, you've got this, this, and this, so I think you're going to do well overall, you know, and I would have data to be able to say that. But like Roger just mentioned, one of the subtypes is people who just seem to do well, and the progression is very slow. And then he also, um, Faye also found a subtype of people where it looked like it was much more aggressive. And so, I mean, from a practical viewpoint, those are the people we should be identifying and having them come in more often. I'm not going to leave them six months or a year before I see them next. So I think we have to work harder on, on um, figuring out whether we call it Parkinson's disease as one disorder or not, but we have to do a better job of personalizing and individualizing. So we're anchored around the dopaminergic degeneration and the uh, cardinal symptoms because you can't have Parkinson's disease unless you have two of the four cardinal signs of, of rigidity, uh, bradykinesia, tremor, and well, bradykinesia. So we're kind of uh, maybe not artificially anchored, but we're anchored there and therapies designed for the dopaminergic system should influence everybody in terms of uh, at least symptomatic therapy. Now there's uh, a, th a theory that's been uh, raised by Ray Chowdhury that people, so we think also, so, so, um, Parkinson's disease is clearly a synucleinopathy. A normal protein in the brain becomes misfolded and spreads throughout the uh, central nervous system. And it's thought by Ray Chowdhury that when this, uh, there may be toxins that enter through the nose traverse and go up into the cortex and are responsible for some of the cognitive issues in Parkinson's disease, but the uh, toxins that get into the in, uh, stomach and colon and enteric nervous system spread backwards in the brain and are responsible for REM sleep disorder. So um, there are all these clinical pathological correlations, but I think that it's, I personally think it's one disease that it manifests through different p patterns and pathways uh, in the central nervous system. Um, can I just ask you, um, you, I understand why you're not using advanced patients for trials, but when it comes down to practical management, these are the people who are going to be asking for this should it become successful. Is there any theoretical basis for the fact that if you do actually transplant functioning neurons, it's going to have a different response to say that the kinesias they're getting from oral medication. Um, we had to think a lot about this because uh, when we were initially designing our clinical trial, we thought, well, we, we should just take people with moderate stage Parkinson's who, who are not more advanced because we felt like on the basis of what we'd seen from previous transplant trials um, was people with a good levodopa response, it was maybe people who were younger. And then in our discussions, including with the FDA, um, we were really encouraged to include people with, who'd had Parkinson's for longer and had more advanced symptoms. So I think we've, we've actually worked with a bioethicist over quite a few years now um, to help us figure out where, where where do we think we draw the line um, in terms of do we take people with more advanced Parkinson's who might have symptoms where they don't stand any chance to benefit from the cells? Um, let's say someone who has really bad memory problems as part of their Parkinson's, and then we'd subject them to known risks but also unknown risks of getting a cell therapy. Um, knowing that some of their serious problems might not stand any chance to benefit. So I think those, we, we, it's, um, there's, no, there's no right answer to this, I think. Um, but we, I think that what we need to do is uh, try to, it goes back to that idea of individualizing, trying to figure out who actually stands some chance to benefit. I don't think it's easy to just make a cutoff by saying mm -hmm. moderate to advanced. Um, yeah, I mean I mean, I think it's, it, it's a very valid point, and, and I think the, the question is, where do you start and where do you end? So, uh, so when we looked at all the data from the fetal dopamine transplants, the group that seemed to benefit most, as best as you could tell, were people who were slightly younger with less advanced disease. 
But that doesn't mean that older people with more advanced disease couldn't respond to it. It just seemed that that looked like the optimal group to begin with. So like a lot of therapies, you'll often say, well, I'm going to pick what I think is the best group to show that I can do this in the most effective way. And then you start to, to expand out of that. So as Jeff said, if you've got Parkinson's disease, by definition, you have to really respond to L-DOPA. We're putting dopamine cells into the brain. So there's no reason to believe that dopamine cell-based therapies could not be useful for everybody. Uh, as Claire says, there's also no point putting dopamine cells in the same way there's no point giving dopamine therapies aggressively to people whose problem is not related to, to the dopamine aspects of Parkinson's disease. So one has to sort of, I think, so I imagine that the way this field will play out if it works, and that's an unknown, is that the envelope will expand and people will start to come in who are younger and less advanced and older and more advanced. There will come a point, and this is what's happened with deep brain stimulation, where you eventually say, actually, I don't think these people are gonna benefit, and we've, and we've got much better at defining what that group is. And ultimately, as some of you would have heard me say before, you know, the future of this therapy, if it really does work, would be it becomes a first-line treatment. You could well imagine that, you know, you have someone with Parkinson's disease, you treat them with a cell-based therapy, and, it, and whilst it doesn't cure people, what it would do is it would stop you needing to take any medication if it really works. And if it really works and you don't need any medication, then you don't get any complications from the medication. So then you don't need all the treatment and the other therapies which are out there at the moment. So whilst people always say it's not a cure, if it really works as well as one would hope, essentially everything you do in 2019 in the clinic in terms of drug therapies uh, becomes redundant. So, so the potential is huge for this. But when you start, you really have to select the group that you think is going to give you the best chance of seeing something rather than just do a sort of, let's take all and see what happens. <laughs> and take that privilege. But really to follow on from that, the heterogeneity of Parkinson's you, you're all very aware of and you've spoken about. Is there uh, more you could say about the choice of cell sources at this stage? I know that it's good that you're looking at different cell sources, but even embryonic-derived cell sources, although they might eventually be produced in a uniform way, come from different sources. Um, we touched on the, in, uh, the immature, induced, pluripotent approach. Is there anything more you could say about the choices at this stage? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. And I think, in a way, it doesn't matter so much where you start, but it matters what you have in the end. So what is the product that you put into the brain? Um, and for me, it's important that that product, whether it comes from an ES cell or an IPS cell, that I know that that product is safe and I know that it's going to be effective when I transplant it. So depending on what cell type you start with, you need to make sure that it's safe and effective in slightly different ways. But if you can do that and show that, then I think that no matter what cell you use, is not so important. If you think in the future and you think about personalized medicines, you can maybe have your own cells. Um, then, of course, you have to go either with iPS cells that June is working with or other types of uh, reprogramming. So I also work with taking skin cells and turning them directly into dopamine neuron uh, for transplantation or even to reprogram. We all have cells in our brain that are not neurons, they're glial cells. So a large part of my group, we work, can we take these glial cells and turn them into a neuron directly inside the brain? With that comes, of course, other questions, because do you want your own cells? It's good because you don't want need immune therapy, maybe. But what if they have a sensitivity to the disease process so that your graft doesn't last for 30 years? It only lasts for 10 years, and then it has Parkinson's disease and stop functioning. So these are all questions that we work on uh, in the laboratory. But for now, I think that what's most important is what is it that you put in the brain? And if you can show that that's safe and effective, that's the best cell source. And there's a couple of different ones for those. What's the best in the future? We just have to see. As, uh as a poor report in stem cells, so there's no difference between ER cells and uh, IPS cells. The only advantage of the IPS cells is that uh, you can use the uh, autologous transplantation. So that means you don't have to immune separation. 
But for now, so it is too expensive, so it is not realistic now. I think, I think the other thing you can't completely divorce out of all of this is these are not, um, they do have some ethical uh, association, some of these cells. So, so there are scientific reasons why there's no difference, but there are also ethical aspects which do govern some people's decisions as to what would be the most ethically acceptable cell to use in, in patients.